Night Garden. We need to see the Awoken. Ah, yes. The Awoken. Out there wavering between the light and the dark. A side should always be taken, little light. Even if it's the wrong side. I've reached the level cap in Destiny, and Bungie's dystopian future Earth is a whole new world. I've never been able to make it to the end game of an MMO before, and while Destiny is not an MMO in the purest sense of the word, it has enough aspects of one that the comparison is apt, especially in regards to the game's included end game content. Level 20 is Destiny's soft level cap. I know you can't see me, but I'm doing air quotes right now. And the point at which Destiny's end game content opens up in full. I'm earning crucible marks during multiplayer matches, scoring vanguard marks as I blast my way through the daily and weekly strike challenges, and rare loot drops are now the norm. Legendary armor and weapons become available after level 20 as well, and I can't wait to grind my way to some sweet upgrades for my warlock. Now to be honest, I'm not entirely sure how Destiny's endgame works. I get that vanguard marks are obtained from the daily and weekly strike challenges, as well as through special events like the recent Queen's Wrath event. I get that Crucible marks are awarded based on performance in competitive multiplayer sessions, and both kind of marks are necessary in order to purchase various high-level weapons and armor from vendors throughout the tower. After that, it gets a little cloudy for me though. I know leveling up after level 20 requires light in some capacity, which is obtained by equipping high-level weapons and armor that have light values. It's not entirely clear how this exactly works in regards to leveling up, or if there are other, perhaps even better, ways of obtaining light other than purchasing items from tower vendors. It's this clarity of progression that is a weak point in regards to all of Destiny's endgame. I've mentioned the things that are kind of clear, but there are a ton of things I don't have much of a clue about. I know there are legendary weapons and armor, but what are these presumed to be even better exotic ones? What do I do with all of these materials I've been gathering, such as spin metal, spirit blooms, and the like? What about weapon parts and ascendant materials? Are these just items I use to purchase legendary and exotic items in the tower? Sure, I'm savvy enough to visit the search engine of my choice should I need a question about Destiny's endgame answered, but it would have been nice to have a tad bit more in the way of explanation in-game. While this may very well have been a deliberate design choice on Bungie's end, perhaps to sort of foster this community of discovery around its game, it still seems like more could have been done in-game to guide high-level guardians. I understand raids, the huge six-man fire team missions that take hours to complete, and nightfalls, a modified version of strike missions, become available after story completion, so I'm looking forward to trying out and unlocking these new mission types. I've heard great things about the Vault of Glass raid, and I'm dying to give it a whirl in the near future. I'm right there with Ben in regards to how mysterious the light system works. I've asked many people on Twitter what the best method is for obtaining light-filled items and I've received various answers. Thankfully I've enjoyed just about everything that Destiny has to offer so far. So if I have to play more strike missions or heroic missions or what have you, I'm more than happy to oblige. Being able to hop into all these missions with friends remains to be the main attraction in my opinion. Sure, some of these strike missions are ones I've already done but there is just something about running through them with friends that never gets old. Toss in the fact that there are now more legendary and rare drops available after level 20, there's always that need for a better assault rifle that keeps me engaged at all times. Another area that I find myself growing more and more attached to is the competitive multiplayer action available within the Crucible. I've always found modern military shooters to be more appealing than sci-fi shooters in regards to online play, I don't know if it's because I've never been able to fare well in an online environment that features special abilities, double jumping, and other exotic gameplay mechanics. However, I think I'm finally over the hump and I have found a fair amount of success while playing online against other fellow guardians. While I would like to see more unique game modes, which I'm sure are in the pipeline, I've found myself drawn in by the frantic gameplay of Destiny's online arena. My only other gripe other than the lack of modes would be the lack of PvP chat. Thankfully, Bungie has stated they are looking to add this soon, so it will likely be a short-lived gripe. Overall, what was originally the least interesting component of Destiny upon release has become possibly my favorite aspect of the game. You neutralize zone A. 
I agree with Brent in regards to the Crucible. I found myself spending a ton of time with the competitive multiplayer, and I'm really enjoying the custom game types that Bungie runs every so often. With Combined Arms, which features matches on the vehicle-based maps, being a particular favorite. Here's hoping some of these game types make their way into the permanent rotation. Heavy ammo inbound. I've discovered Remote Play recently, and it works extremely well, as many titles do over the streaming Vita feature. I was able to settle comfortably into a patrol mission play session, and it's a great feature with which to grind experience and loot when you're away from the game cave. Having the run button mapped to the down arrow on the D-pad is a brilliant move, and it's a great solution in the absence of an R3 button. It's easy to subtly roll your thumb up from the left thumbstick to the D-pad, and I expect to see future games, especially first-person ones, utilize this control scheme. Of course, playing the game streaming over the Vita isn't quite the same as sitting in front of your big screen with the DualShock 4 in hand, but Remote Play continues to be an enticing option for experiencing your PlayStation 4 away from your TV. Sunday football and remote play loot grinding, anyone? We touched on Destiny's story heavily in part two of our video series, and my feelings remain largely the same as I head into the final leg of the main campaign. I've made my way through Venus, and only Mars lies before me and becoming legend. Or something like that. Story missions still play out in the same way, and the narrative is still not particularly deep or focused. In fact, it could be categorized as somewhat confusing as the Queen is added into the equation. And honestly, that's not something that severely hampers my enjoyment, because in a game like this, I think the world and the gameplay are paramount. Bungie wants you to live and breathe in Destiny's world, and that necessitates that the game and the mythos they've constructed be an interesting place that you want to play in. In that regard, Bungie has succeeded with flying colors. I remain enamored with the fictional sci-fi future behind Destiny. Would I have liked a more focused and elaborate affair, more akin to what Bungie accomplished with their Halo titles? Of course, and I remain hopeful that we'll see some of this more refined storytelling as Destiny continues to evolve in the months and years ahead. Of all the locations I've been to throughout Destiny's campaign, Venus has been my favorite by far. When I played the first mission, it was hard not to see some similarities to The Last of Us in regards to how there are many areas featuring deserted cities where buildings are now covered in foliage. You can sense that something bad has happened here, and it creates a sense of unease as you make your way through the hordes of fallen troops. Not only is it my favorite area when it comes to level design, but Venus also features my favorite enemy so far in the Vex. These robotic nemesis pack some serious firepower and attack in hordes. To make matters worse, many of them have the ability to teleport quickly and they'll be on top of you if you're not aware of your surroundings. I've gone back a few times to play the third mission on Venus where you take on waves of Vex in an archive room, and when played on the hardest difficulty, the Minotaurs prove to be quite the adversary, and it's awesome bringing those behemoths down one at a time while coordinating with friends. As I've said all along, the story isn't the best, but it still manages to keep me engaged and gives me a reason to keep caring about seeing what happens next. I do hope the plot thickens a little more by the time I hit Mars, but overall, it's been a fun ride so far through the campaign of Destiny. In the end, the most exciting thing about Destiny, at least in my eyes right now, is the bright future ahead. This is just the beginning, the genesis behind a universe with bigger things to come, and it's a beginning I continue to really enjoy. I feel like I'm on the ground level of something that's only going to continue to grow and get better. I'm stoked to see what new stories lie ahead across the four corners of this world, what new modes and game types await, and what exciting new loot I'll have access to. In the meantime, I've got some leveling up to do. The Vault of Glass awaits. Can't we just stay here with the murderous robots? No, little light. Don't do that. 